morning, everyone. Before you have a seat, how about we change things up a little bit? Go ahead and say hi to your neighbor this morning. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that we can gather in your house, that we can uh, fellowship with one another, that we can worship with one another, that we can hear your word proclaimed. I pray that as we uh, come to this time of worship, that our hearts and our minds would be uh, active, that they would be willing to hear what you have to say for us. I pray for Pastor Wayne that you would heal his body, that you would keep him uh, healthy and in good spirits, that you would keep uh, Johnny and Sarah also safe as well. Uh, we do know that there is a lot of this virus going around again, that it never did just completely disappear, that uh, there is still sickness out there that does need to be um, addressed. So uh, may we as the church be able to come alongside them and help them if they are in need of any help. Uh, we pray for a complete healing and that Wayne would be back here next week. Uh, Father, we also pray for uh, not just our students, but for every student across uh, the nation, around the world, as they are looking at going back to school. We do know that uh, school can be a time of great anxiety and a time of uh, great worry for, for these kids, even parents. I pray that you would uh, protect them, that you would give them wisdom as they go about uh, the school year. I pray for the teachers, that you would uh, strengthen them for the task that is before them. I also pray that you would uh, protect their minds from anything that is not uh, holy and uh, uplifting to you, Lord Jesus. So we pray for these students, we pray for uh, their parents, we pray for uh, the teachers and the faculty and, and the school administrators, and I just pray that you would uh, guide them to your truth. And Jesus, we love you, and in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand up together and let's worship. <laughs> Some 28 years ago, I heard this song. 
turn your eyes upon Jesus. It reminds me of our pastor, Bob Castles, that could sing. Pastors do a lot of things, but this pastor could really sing. And that was his closing song after his service. And he would, I mean, he put 150% in it. It was just, I mean, he was excited. So I am just thankful I didn't know what to say today. I'm a man with very short words, a few words. But um, I was glad to see that in the bulletin this morning. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, as we come before you in your midst, Lord, we just pause and thank you, Lord. Thank you for everything that you've done for us, Father. Thank you for the week that you uh, watched over us through the rains and the floods and the trees falling down, Father. I pray that, um, that uh, everything went well in this community. Uh, Lord, we just uh, come before you now, Lord, just uplifting our members of this church, Father, the ones that are going through sickness, Father, the ones that are in a hospital, the ones that have passed away, Father. Lord, we just pray in a special prayer for them, Father. Pray for the ones that are um, seeking new ways to um, adventure out, Father. School, as uh, Brady said, starts. Father, I just pray for them. I pray for the ones that will be going to college, Father, that uh, you'll watch over them and not let them, not let them forget their roots, Father. Go with them, Father. Nudge them. Put that hedge of protection around them and guide them. Ones, Father, that are thinking about a different avenue, about leaving the nest, Lord, I just pray for them. Pray for the parents that will be thinking about it. And Lord, uh, we just uh, come before you at this time with our tithes and our offerings, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you use them for your kingdom. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
<laughs> you all uh, know, probably at this point, for a while, on Wednesday nights, we've been going through the Gospel of Mark, and I uh, have loved it. I, I've enjoyed it. I believe the kids, have, I'm telling them they've enjoyed it. Uh, and and we've, we've had a very in-depth study of the Gospel of Mark, and so we were scheduled for this coming Wednesday to get to Mark chapter 6, but now we are going to move Mark chapter 6 to today, and then Mark chapter 6, whatever comes after it, to this coming Wednesday. So if you see a YC kid this morning, tell them they missed out on something great. So uh, we're going to look at just the first 13 verses of Mark chapter 6, and, and something that we've made note of, every time people have come into contact with Jesus in this gospel, is that nobody ever comes into him and, and is just indifferent to his person or to his presence or what he has to say. Nobody gets to Jesus in this gospel and just goes, eh, you know, on to the next person. No, when you read the gospels, you see that there are extreme reactions on both sides to Jesus. You see people who are overjoyed. You see people who are just fall down and, and worship and praise. You see people who come to be healed because they see something in Jesus that is absolutely worth getting to. So that is, uh, this is a very positive way of approaching Jesus. But as we also see in the Gospels, and I'm sure some of you are aware, there are also negative ways that we see people react and come to Jesus. I'm sure the Pharisees pop into your head right away that it, they did not respond positively to Jesus. Instead, what we see is anger. And beyond anger, we see hatred. We see the spirit of destruction. Now, why is it that they respond in that way to Jesus? You would think that seeing what they would see, hearing what they would hear, they would be overjoyed. This is the Messiah coming to the world. You would think that Jesus would be everything that they were hoping for and looking for. These people who claimed to know the word of God, the law, better than anybody else. Here was the one that it all was pointing to. But they despised him. Why? Because they are offended by what Jesus is saying and what he is doing? Why are they offended? Because what Jesus does is he is attacking the very things that they held most dear. Jesus confronts them at their pressure points. And if you are a Pharisee, if you're the Pharisee, that is Jesus attacking your self-righteousness. Look, Jesus is saying, basically, you think that you're standing before man and you're standing before God is based off of of you and your self-righteousness, but no, it is entirely about me. So let me ask you this. You don't have to answer it. If this was YC, we'd have a great discussion about it. Hopefully. They're teenagers. It could have gone either way. Have you ever been offended before? To which all the teenagers would say, no, we're great. We've had no problems before, <laughs> which makes my job a little bit easier. No, chances are you have been offended before. Chances are we all have been offended about something. So then the next question would be, well, what was it that made you offended? Likely, didn't the offense likely come when someone directly or maybe indirectly challenged your way of thinking and your belief? And then one little last thing to meditate on is when you are offended... Does the offense typically feel worse when it's by someone that you know, or is it by someone that you don't know? What feels worse? Now, I would think that for the most part, we feel worse if the offense is to somebody that we know. We usually will say, eh, it's somebody who we don't know. We don't really care what they think. That's Laura's method of driving. I get super panicky while I'm driving. I don't even know if my horn works in the car because I don't want to offend this total stranger who's still stuck at the green light. But typically, we usually want to not offend the people that we know. We think that is the worst offense to offend. So what we're going to see, though, today, how this all relates to offense, is that not only did Jesus offend, and that thought, even that phrasing right there, that Jesus is offensive, that might even prick something inside of you where you're like, that doesn't really sound right. It'll all make sense. Not only does Jesus offend, his followers, if we are to be faithful followers, 
must offend as well. So, let's open up in prayer, and then we're going to read Mark 6, 1 through 13. And you can also sign up for our YC updates, because these are the same slides I was going to use on Wednesday. You can text that. And we have a website. But let's pray, and then we're going to dive into these verses. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that we can spend time in your word. I pray that uh, your spirit would, would just pour out on us as we look at what you have to say in the gospel. We know that these words are, are not just words penned by, by a human author. These are God's words. These are God's truths for us. I pray that those truths would, would come alive in, in ways that we could not even imagine as we uh, meditate and, and take in your word. Jesus, we love you, and it's in your, prayer, and in your name that we pray. Amen. Mark 6, 1 through 13, this is what we read. Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and the many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him in such miracles as these performed by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. And he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. And he was going around the villages teaching. And he summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over the unclean spirit. And he instructed them that they should take nothing for their journey except a mere staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belt, but to wear sandals. And he added, do not put on two tunics. And he said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave town. Any place that does not receive you or listen to you as you go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. They went out and preached that men should repent, and they were casting out many demons and were anointed with oil, many sick people, and healing them. So we're going to just look at those first six verses if you're following along in your Bible. This past Wednesday, we looked at the end of Mark chapter 5. And at the end of Mark chapter 5, we see two great uh, healing accounts. We see the uh, woman who had had a hemorrhage, internal bleeding for 12 years healed. And we also see the raising to life, uh, the Jewish synagogue leader's daughter, uh, who, who was uh, Jairus Goes calls for Jesus, the daughter dies while they're on their way, and then Jesus raised him back to life. So at this point, they have left that town, and now Jesus and his disciples are going back to Nazareth. If you are familiar with the Christmas story, or maybe if you have uh, read the Gospels, you will know that Nazareth is not just some random town. It is a very important part of Jesus' ministry, and that is because this is Jesus' hometown. Right? So Jesus and his family, they're from this incredibly small town of Nazareth. It's been said that at the time of Jesus, that there were as many as 400 to maybe 4,000 people which lived there. So it is obviously not this metropolitan center that Jerusalem was. And knowing that Jesus was from this small town, it's pretty easy easy for us to imagine that Jesus is well known here. There's not a lot of people that need to know him because there's not a lot of people. Jesus was the biggest thing to ever come from Nazareth. And from what we we see in these verses, people knew Jesus' entire family. And you all likely know this of, of living in a small town, but you know that gas travels fast in a small town, right? You do not need to... Uh, wait around long enough to hear something if something big happens in La Crosse or South Hill or Bracey. No, once one person knows, it seems like everybody knows, and that's one of the benefits of small-town living, good or bad, right? So surely, at this point in Jesus' ministry, word has gotten all around Nazareth of exactly what Jesus, the son of Mary, and Joseph is up to. Even if somebody's living under a rock, chances are the word has wiggled itself under the rock and they know something about it. And what Jesus does when he comes to Nazareth is he does the same thing that he has done in so many other places in his ministry. Right? He he does the same thing. He teaches the people. And it's important to remind us that that when Jesus came, he did not come as, as just a miracle worker. 
right? He didn't come just as a uh, good teacher. He did not just come as a, a good moral example. No, Jesus came to teach. More specifically, he came to preach. He came to point people to himself. Jesus did not come and preach a social gospel, right? Jesus did not come and have this felt needs ministry. Jesus did not uh, just tell a bunch of people, hey, we're having a Bible study at my house, and and let's just kind of talk about what this means to you. Let's just get together, and and we can look at this verse in Isaiah, and, and you can just tell me, well, what do you think it means about you? How does this relate to your life? No, Jesus came and he preached repentance. In fact, the very first words that Mark records of Jesus in Mark 1.15 is this. Jesus says, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Really what Jesus is saying is that the time is at hand, the kingdom of God has come, and because that is so, therefore repent. Jesus did not come preaching saying, Hey, live your best life right now. Give me $100 and you will reap forth a 1000 if you do it in faith. He's not coming to just bolster us up in our confidence, right? No, he's not saying, you're mostly fine. Let's put some pain on it and we'll, we'll check the engine later. No, he comes preaching repentance. He called people to be aware that the kingdom of God has come. Look, the very message that you and I need that the world needs, that very message is the exact message that Jesus preached throughout his entire ministry. It is the exact message that every faithful follower of Christ has preached since 2,000 years ago. It is the same gospel. And as we see in so many other places, the people that hear him preach, they're not indifferent to the message. No, they are astonished at what Jesus says. They are amazed at what Jesus is teaching. And it's because they've never heard anything like it. In Mark 1.22, uh, when we read of people responding to Christ's teaching, this is how Mark records it. They were amazed at his teachings. For he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. In Mark 6, we, we read that these men and women, they, they listened and they could not help but asking, where did this man get these things? Where did he get these things? And, and what is this wisdom given to him in such miracles as these performed by his hands? So, so they've heard the teaching. They've seen miracles. They probably have heard miracles all over, from all over happening. They readily admit that Jesus is doing something, but the thing is, they cannot comprehend what Jesus is doing. They just cannot wrap their heads around who Jesus is. In verse 3, we see the questions, they they continue. They have so many questions, which on on one hand is good. We want people to ask questions about Jesus. They're, They're asking this, though. They say, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, are not his sisters here with us? So it's clear that Jesus is, is physically, it's not a mystery. They know who he is. They know his background. They know his family. They know his upbringing. They know that even prior to this, that Jesus was a carpenter, that he worked with his earthly father, Joseph. Chances are, this is such a small town, and, and people were not as eager to move out of the familiarity of their uh, family life. They would not go usually on big journeys and then not come back. Chances are, many of these people have seen Jesus grow up. And something that's worth noting is that considering how small this town was, based off of what we read here and what we see in other places in the Gospels, there was a question of Jesus' parents, and this was probably a very well-talked-about topic. The subject and doctrine of the virgin birth was not a, a newer controversy. One might even say that it was one of the first controversies as to who Jesus was. In John 8, 41, uh, the, we read this, that the Pharisees say to Jesus, we were not born of fornication, we have one Father God. And this is clear, a plain-as-day accusation that They're saying, Jesus, you were born out of wedlock. See, there's always the thought 
It may not have been spoken about. It may have been too taboo. But there's likely always this thought that Mary was, was this young girl that got pregnant before she got married. Was it Joseph? They don't know. But the question was there. And, and we see, I believe, this happening in Mark 6, 3. We notice the people, they, they, notice this, they, they don't ask the question, isn't this the son of Joseph? They don't, they don't ask, isn't this Joseph's son? What do, they, what do they say? They ask, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? And in a culture where the role of the father was so important, don't you think that if there was no question whatsoever as to who his father was, they would have led with, isn't this the son of Joseph? It seems that even though they clearly have seen Jesus grow up, they clearly know him, they act as if they don't. They ask the question, isn't this the son of of Mary. Is not this the carpenter? It's not Mary. In verse 2, they just refer to him as this man. And then in verse 3, he, he's just the carpenter. With all that in mind, how do these people respond to Jesus? Well, at the end of verse 3, we, we, we saw this. And they took offense at him. Now, why were they so offended? Ultimately, it's because they could not make sense of him. They could not justify how this human could do what he was doing and say the things with authority that he was saying. Their sinful minds would not allow Jesus to be any more than just a man. They, they were blinded to the divinity of Jesus Christ. One of my professors, uh, Dr. Aiken, he, he said this, he said, these people, they're scandalized by all this talk and hoopla about Jesus. I love the word hoopla. He offends their personal sensibilities. His works they cannot deny and his words they cannot handle, but they do not care. In spite of overwhelming evidence, they will not believe he is the Christ, the Son of God. Here is what this means. You cannot come into the presence of Jesus as you were and not be offended. You cannot come into the presence of Jesus and not be offended. And I would go as far as saying, if Jesus has never offended you, then you do not know the true Jesus, and you do not know who he really is. See, Jesus must offend because everything about him challenges and offends the way that we view things. So the, the question then that we need to answer not, not for others, but for ourselves, is am I ashamed of Jesus? Am I offended by what he says? Am I offended by the things that he does? And am I afraid to let people know who Jesus is to me? Look, the Jesus that you are so offended by is the very same Jesus that you and I so desperately need. We do not want and we cannot have a lesser Jesus. R.C. Sproul, he says this, he says, Jesus was rejected by his own people, by his family, by the townsmen, by the nation of Israel. The one whom God appointed to be the cornerstone of his building was considered flawed and repulsive by his contemporaries. In verses 4 and 6, we see Jesus, he quotes an old proverb that says, A prophet is held in high regard and honor everywhere except in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own household. What Jesus, this is just a further judgment, a further indictment on the people that have rejected him. This rejection, it's so great, it's so heartbreaking that Jesus doesn't really do any miracles there. He, he heals a few people, but in verse 6, it, it says a whole lot and a whole little. God says a lot more in four words than what we can do in 400. It says so much. He just says, Jesus wondered at their unbelief. Everywhere Jesus went, he encountered unbelief. But there seems to be something more behind this, about this unbelief that he faces in his own hometown. I would hope that Jesus could not look at the state of the church 
these people that he knew who claimed to know him and say the same thing of us. That he would not look at the people who claimed to know him, but be totally in wonder at how unbelieving we really are. If you've not seen it by nail, Jesus is offensive. The message of the gospel is offensive. And if the gospel does not offend you at your core, is it really addressing anything of substance in our lives? The gospel must offend. Paul talks about this in, in 1 Corinthians 1, 20 through 24. He says, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Just a few verses later in verse 27, he says, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. Look, the cross has always been scandalous. The message of the gospel has always been and always will be scandalous. Even in the time of Paul, the Jews and the Greeks, they could not wrap their heads around a, a dead and crucified Savior. That in itself did not line up with, with where they saw wisdom, where they saw power. They just did not, it made no sense to them. Yet we know that it's through power made perfect in weakness that Jesus saves. That's the beauty of the cross. That's the beauty of the gospel. I love how Stephen Lawson says, he says, to the world, the cross is a gory story, but to those that are saved, it is a story of glory. For the past 2,000 years, Christianity has offended. And the moment that Christianity stops offending, I believe it stops being Christianity. Everywhere Jesus goes, he offends. And everywhere the people of God go, they will offend as well. And we see this play out in verses 7 through 13. And back in Mark chapter 6, just to kind of give you a recap of what happens, let's, let's read it. Again, we see that Jesus, he summons the twelve and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over the unclean spirits and he instructed them that they should take nothing for their journey except a mere staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belt, but to wear sandals and he added, do not put on two tunics. And he said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave town. Any place that does not receive you or listen to you as you go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. They went out and preached that men should repent, and they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil, many sick people, and healing them. Jesus, in this passage, we see he gives the twelve an assignment, and they, they have uh, pretty clear instructions on what, on what they are to do. They are to go and uh, cast out demons. He gives them the authority to do so, and specifically, he commands them to go out and notice what he is preaching. It tells them to preach. It's a message of repentance. It's the same message from Mark chapter 1. Repent. Probably just a coincidence. Probably not. He gives them specific commands on what they are to take and how they are to conduct themselves. And, and he, Jesus gives them a packing list, but you've probably noticed it is not a very in-depth packing list. Right? It, it, it is the bare minimum. It might even be below the bare minimum. All I know is that for my YC parents, if I gave the same exact packing list to the students that uh, Jesus gives to the disciples, they wouldn't be happy and we'd have a whole lot of stinky middle school boys at camp. He tells them, go out with, with your staff, the clothes on your back, a pair of sandals. And this is a very important reminder that is really for every Christian in this room. Do I believe that Jesus is just trying to teach his followers a, a lesson on humility and minimalistic living, or, or it's 
that he's pointing to some socialist society where we all just share what we have and everybody's happy and sings kumbaya, not at all. I think that what Jesus is teaching them, and by extension, he's looking over them and looking at us, is that if we want to follow Jesus, we must trust his willingness to give and his ability to provide. Our lives are entirely in his hands. Every element of our lives is in the hands of Jesus. And, and, and these men are, are preaching a message that nobody wants to hear. Really, nobody wants to hear a message of repentance, and yet they're trusting their livelihoods to these very people that they're taking this offensive message to. What Jesus is doing is showing these 12 that everything that they truly need to follow him, he readily provides for them. And what this means for us as well is that if God has a if God has something for you to do, then he will give you the means to do it and the joy to follow through with it. The work of the Christian is God's work. If God has a task for you, he will see to it that you have everything that you need in order to do that task. It's God's work. We do not pick up a bunch of pieces like, like a, a you know, thrown out, scrambled all over the place puzzle and then show God the picture on the box and say, this is what we're aiming for. And he doesn't go, ah, oh, okay, I see it now. No, this is God's work entirely of him. And I want to strongly encourage you, especially in light of the enlistment coming up, that if you feel God has put something on your heart for you to do, do it. If you feel that God is leading you to do something, do it. You don't have to have everything put together in a, with a nice little bow PowerPoint presentation uh, to present to heaven. If you feel God placing it on you, and it's something good, not like you know, if you're crazy saying, you know, God told me and the voice has told me to blow up something, don't follow that one. If God has given you something truly of him, he will see to it that you are provided for. Now, you might say and argue, well, Brady, what about those missionaries that feel that very same call, that very same pull to go and do these great things for the gospel, to do these great things for the Lord that are struck down, that are killed, that are slaughtered on the mission field in these unreached peoples, in the unreached places? Did they finish the work that God gave to them? Did God provide for them? Absolutely, he did. Understand this, the marks of a successful ministry will never be judged by the eyes of men. The marks of what makes ministry successful is through the eyes of the Lord. I think of someone who, who you are all pretty, maybe familiar with, of, of Jim Elliott. Maybe, there you go, of, of Jim Elliott. He, this is the a uh, 28-year-old missionary who went to Ecuador. And he was only there, I, I want to say, for about four months when he was speared to death by the very tribe that he went to minister to. Not only was he killed, these four other men died in the same exact way. Now, in the eyes of the men, what could this death accomplish? It seems like the work's done. What could, what could be accomplished? To man, nothing. But to God, it accomplished everything that God intended. I cannot even begin to tell you the number of stories to this day. This happened in the 19, I want to say 40s, 50s, around then. It was a while ago. People still look to these men and feel the push and the pull to go. And they've answered a call to a lifetime of gospel work. These men have accomplished more in their death than they did in their lives. I think of one of my personal ministry heroes that, that you, you've heard me mention before, David Brainerd, the great missionary to the Native Americans who uh, was, died from tuberculosis in the 18th century at just 29 years old. 
and, and the amount of work that Brainerd did, the distance that he traveled, the impact that he had in just like three and a half years, just, it blows my mind. He's done, he did more in three years of ministry than I've been able to do in ten. To this day, people read his diary. They feel driven by God to missions. Did God provide for these men? Absolutely he did. And even in death, the greatest provision was already given to them. The moment that their life ended here, a new life begins before the throne of God. Everything, absolutely everything that you truly need to do the work of God, He will give to you and provide you with the fire and the joy to do it. However, that work that He has will ultimately offend others. And that should not surprise us because Jesus tells his followers in John 15, 18 through 19, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Your proximity to Christ will absolutely offend the world. And far too many Christians believe this, that they can walk side by side with the world but that's not the case. We know we are to be in the world, but not of the world. And if you're faithful to Christ, a faithful servant of Christ, you should expect opposition. You should expect to be looked at as loony, as weird, as, as offensive. But, but keep in mind, you are in good company. The author of Hebrews reminds us that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. For 2,000 years, the church has offended with the message of the gospel, and it absolutely cannot stop being offensive. We need to be mindful of, and Jesus warns his followers of this, that, that we need to embrace the concept of rejection. It's okay that not everybody loves you. It's okay that you're not the first round pick in the eyes of the world. Not everyone is going to love our message. Not everyone is going to accept the message, and we need to be mindful of the fact that it is not us that are rejected, it is Christ. Luke 10, 16, Jesus says, the one who listens to you listens to me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. Look, it is not your job for those around you to accept Jesus and the gospel. You on your own cannot do that. You cannot make someone do that. Only God can bring eternal life change. But your job, every one of us, from, from the youngest to the oldest, is to be faithful with what you have been given and trust God with the results. You do your, you do your work, and you trust God to do his. God does not need your trust in order for him to do what he's already doing. But I tell you what, life is a lot easier when you just trust him to be him and you do what you need to do. If God has given you a job, it does not matter if you please the world. We don't work for the world to tell us, well done, good and faithful servant. No, we work to please our commanding officer. So what are you going to do? Look, no matter how you live your life, you're going to live it in offense to someone. The question is, would you rather offend the world or would you rather offend the God of the universe? And only one of those has eternal significance. And know that if you've not placed your faith in Christ, then you are living in active offense and disobedience to God. You've offended the great judge of the universe. And just as Jesus came preaching a message of repentance... We need to repent. We need to turn to Christ as, as the Savior of the soul. But if Jesus has saved you, we know with confidence that God is for you. And if God is for you, it does not matter who is against you and who is offended at you. But if God is against you, then it does not matter who is for you. So who is it that is against you? Who is it that you offend? And then finally, what job do you have to do? If God has given you a task, trust in his provision and trust that he will give you the strength 
to do it. And, and you may not know right now what God has for you to do. But may you prayerfully seek what it is. Here's the thing. The thing that God is placing on your heart to do, that job God has for you and specifically you. There's no one else like you. Will you go and do what God has ordained for you regardless of what the world thinks? Will you go out and be an offense to the world knowing that you have greater acceptance and worth in the eyes of Jesus than in the eyes of the world? And that is enough. If, if you are content with that, then you have no problem going out with just the shoes on your feet and the clothes on your back to make a change in the world for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray, and then we will respond. Lord Jesus, we do know that the gospel is offensive. All of us, if we are honest, will admit that we are offended by, or have been offended by what you have said, because you challenge us. You push us in ways that, that we are uncomfortable with, but how needed those shoves and pushes are. I pray that we would uh, prayerfully consider the work that you have for us to do. May we do it with uh, full knowledge that you will give us the joy and the abilities to carry out the task that you have specifically for us. And even if it costs us our very lives, we know that it is not wasted and that we have a, a, a place before the king of the universe that is waiting for us. Jesus, we thank you for the privilege of getting to be your church. I pray that you would not be uh, ashamed or, or uh, caught off guard by the unbelief of your people, but that we would be good and faithful servants. Lord, we love you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.